All right, I think we uh, actually have a quorum here, so we're going to get started. It is uh, 6.04, and I call the SAU board meeting uh, tonight, uh, Monday, June the 1st, uh, to order. Um, a couple of uh, um, points of process for this evening. Just uh, as a reminder, this is an open meeting, um, and uh, we're using a different platform than the webinar version. So we want to make sure that uh, anyone who would like to speak, either raise your hand using the uh, raise your hand feature uh, through Zoom, uh, or you can send me a chat. I do ask that everyone refrain from chatting each other because this is an open meeting. All that stuff is subject to uh, public disclosure and unfortunately we don't have the best capabilities to provide that to the public. So uh, as members of the public and members of board, please uh, refrain from communicating using the chat feature with each other. Um, and uh, if you would like to uh, address the group as a whole, just make sure you use the feature to raise your hand or send me a personal chat and I will let you know what order you will be uh, for, for, for speaking using the chat feature. Um, so let's uh, get started uh, here. We're gonna switch things up uh, from the agenda, just uh, one quick minor uh, swap out. And that's because uh, uh, we've got a, uh, um, uh, a priority that, that wants to speak as uh, our board chair updates that does need to depart before seven o'clock. So we're gonna switch out the individual board updates with the opening items from the superintendent. We're gonna actually swap those. So I'm gonna actually first turn it over to Pim for the update for the Sohegan board. Thanks, Steve. Um, got me by surprise, but that's good. That's all right. Uh, so uh, the uh, I, sorry, the South Lincoln Cooperative School Board. We actually had two meetings uh, this past month. We had one right after the SAU meeting on the 11th, and then another one uh, on the 19th because we had a lot of, of uh, different topics to talk about. Uh, and I'll just run through them. Um, and if anybody has any specific questions afterwards, uh, feel free to to ask quickly, or uh, you can always email me at pflonster at Um So we talked about the unassigned uh, fund balance and priority of projects. We're gonna look more into that in our regular meeting uh, tomorrow and make decisions on what we wanna do moving forward there. Uh, we did talk a bit about- And after the SAU meeting on the 11th, and then another one uh, on the 19th. So balance and priority of projects. We're gonna look more into that in our What's that weird feedback? Okay. Um, we talked about remote learning and whether or not it's been successful. Uh, we would. Uh, we also talked about the possibility or, uh, of getting a survey out to students and families to see how their experiences were with that. Um, and we'll be following up with that tomorrow as well. Uh, we talked about various policies uh, that we've been uh, either having first readings of and, and or uh, ready to vote on questions that have come up uh, with those policies as well, uh, trying to get clarification, etc. cetera. Um, on the 19th, the community council uh, gave us a presentation. It really worked on clarifying their roles uh, with their, not just their roles, but the roles of all the three-legged stool, as we call it, between uh, the community council being a leg, the administration being a leg, and the board being a leg. Um, one of the things that we really hit on, uh, or actually that came out of that as a positive, I think, is really trying to work between the board and the community council to start to coordinate our topics. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do um, throughout the SAU is start to develop a calendar of topics that are coming up, and then uh, that way we can share that with the community council and see how it dovetails with any of their um, topics that are coming up. Uh, that way we're uh, working together instead of against each other um, for what resources, not, not other reasons. Anyway, um, we also talked about uh, some personnel changes um, that are going to be part of budget considerations um, for um, the next budget cycle. Um, scheduled reconfiguration that was brought to the community council uh, and went through several iterations. Um, I think Bill Hagen might be giving us an update on that. Um, so I won't go into that any further. Uh, we talked about our strategic vision, what competency-based education, mastery-based education looks like, what that's going to um, you know, be going into the future. And we're going to actually devote a full meeting this summer uh, to, those, to that topic in general 
um, and really get a lot of good, um, in my mind, I hopefully anyway, a lot of good insight and really understand where we are with that and where we want, more importantly, where we want to go with that and, and uh, overall implementation. Um, we also had a presentation on the 19th, um, or maybe more of a plea, <laughs> by three of our science teachers who provided um, their viewpoints on the science classroom upgrades. Uh, they are by lots of people's standards lacking in a lot of areas. And uh, we're looking at possibly upgrading those, possibly using an assigned fund balance, possibly other sources, or possibly delaying that. Um, and then lastly, kind of spoke briefly about some of our end of year activities. Um, and I know that uh, I think that's one of the topics that Adam's going to speak about this evening. So um, a lot of stuff over those course of those two meetings. So uh, if anybody has any quick questions, I'm happy to answer now, or we can, you know, like I mentioned, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to answer in more uh, detail. Great, thanks, Pim. I don't see any questions or hands raised uh, for the moment. So let's go to uh, Sarah Lawrence and uh, folks up on the Hill. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so at our meeting, we also discussed our unassigned fund balance. Um, we discussed um, projects that would be being done uh, over the summer versus ones that have been able to be done as school has been in a different situation the last couple of months. Um, we were also able to get a um, an update from our curriculum coordinators about how you know how our focus points have been going in math and uh, reading and science and we had a really wonderful discussion about world language um, in Mont Vernon we were able to have our Spanish teacher present um, she was able to provide some real insight into how our program is going and kind of the direction that we hope that it can take in the next couple of years so that was very exciting um, as I scroll my notes here, I think that covers the major parts of it. Um, you know, the big things were, were highlighted in the principal's report at the last SAU board meeting. So um, not much else there other than that. Um, we also discussed our sixth grade graduates and how that might be celebrated. Um, and I believe Principal Schettinger will be addressing that in his principal's update tonight too. So I won't belabor that, but um, we had a nice meeting. So thanks for allowing us to give you that update. Awesome. Don't see any hands raised either. So let's go to Beth and Amherst. Um, we spent pretty much our entire meeting discussing our unreserved fund balance, um, going through a list of potential items that we could be um, spending some of that balance on. Um, we had a lot of money left over this year. Um, a lot of it's because of COVID. Um, some other things. So we're definitely um, getting through some much needed work that's um, needed for our buildings um, that may not have necessarily been in the um, capital needs plan um, or they were but they weren't in it, um, the right time of when it's actually being um, needed. So we're looking at that. Uh, we started to talk about it. We hit some things but we had questions on some others. So we're going to be spending a lot of time on that later on this week as well on Thursday night, we're going to be discussing it again to finalize um, our plans for it and deciding um, exactly how much is going to be spent um, and then how much is going to be returned to the taxpayers. Great. Thanks, Beth. Still seeing no hands raised. Um, let's do two committee updates. We're going to start off actually um, with the communication committee with Amy Facey. Hi. So yeah, actually, um, I don't think we have an SAU communications committee, but I'm on the Sohe Sohegan communications committee. And um, one idea that I had and I wanted to, um, I let Stephen know I wanted to uh, make sure that the board was okay with me moving forward was um, in talking to some of the, the media in town and talking to the Sohegan communications committee, uh, there seems to be potentially a, a need to have an easy way to access important dates that are happening within the SAU. Um, and I, I had a meeting with Cliff Ann at 
the Citizen, and that um, publication is going digital. And we had the idea of coming up with a calendar that had important dates that are happening in the SAU and having that published monthly. Uh, so thought that it would be a good way to have that information consolidated into one place. Uh, and so I talked to Adam about it and um, I guess Abby is, you know, keeps the large master schedule, but we um, had the idea to work together and have sort of an easy format that could be put out probably hopefully both on the website as well as in the citizen for folks to be able to see upcoming dates and important um, dates and events. So I, before I went forward with that, because it really is an SAU-wide initiative as opposed to a Sohegan, I just wanted to um, make sure that the board was okay with me moving forward with that. And Amy, just a quick question for you. Do you wanna see sure. if you can get additional volunteers or is that something that you wanted to leave yeah. the charge with? Yeah, I think, you know, it's really going to be Abby who's going to have to um, maintain it, but I want to work with her to get it started. Um, and then it really, you know, the information should flow out of the SAU. So I don't really need anybody else to help me. I'm happy to do it. Um, if someone has a burning desire to be involved, then, then sure. It's just something I think we're going to work on over the summer and hopefully be able to roll out um, when school starts. Great. I love the idea. Uh, anybody else want to provide any feedback? I see uh, uh, Beth's got a comment. Go ahead. Sure. Um, is it going to be published as a hard list or more of a, you know, live list so that, you know, if something changes last second, we are able to adjust it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't want to, you know, make Abby have to be constantly updating it I, and have it be a burdensome um, item for her. So I was envisioning it more as a monthly, mm -hmm. um, but perhaps there's a way to do that. I, I don't know. I don't really know the the platform that, that we'll be using yet. So um, I hear you. It would be nice to have sort of an ongoing update, but I also, she's so busy, I don't want to make it so that it's cumbersome um, and, and not sustainable. Okay. Great. Thank you. Ellen. Amy, is this in lieu of using more of the SAU 39 page, um, the website for people to access information or in addition to? Yeah, it would be, an, I can barely hear you, Ellen, but it would be um, in, a, in addition to, I think, you know, she's done a lot of work to coordinate all of the calendars into one. So this would really just be extracting important dates. So, you know, like we all, as parents and board members and um, folks who are signed into Nixle get lots of information, but there are people out in the community who may not have children in the school who are uh, not signed into Nixle who might want to be able to know what's happening um, within our schools and, and the SAU. So yeah, and, and as you know, I'm happy to take um, uh, input you know, and I can even put a draft out at some point when we have that and get feedback from everybody and, and um, see how we can tweak it as we go. Cool. I love the idea. I don't think emotions needed, uh, Amy. I think uh, something that I think we can all just mutually agree to, uh, to, to consent to it uh, okay. and, uh, and, and, and go from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. Um, let's go next to the, well, first of all, any more questions or comments for Amy? No? Great. Hearing none, let's uh, move to the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee, and Shannon Gasquin is going to lead uh, the report on that. So actually, I'm going to start that, Stephen. Okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you for introducing Shannon. Um, so Shannon is the Vice Chair of the Joint Facilities Committee. And we um, were talking and thought, you know, as we head into summer, uh, we wanted to make sure that the board had all of the uh, relevant information on the work that has been done so far and where we're going. So a little bit of this is going to be repetitive from last, um, our last board meeting, but we put together um, a 
PowerPoint presentation. It won't be long, I promise. But just so, and I can um, email that out to board members just so you have something to refer to going forward. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh oh. Host has disabled screen sharing. <laughs> Adam. There you go. You should be all set now. Okay, thanks. All right, I just have to check one thing and make sure this is the latest one. It's hard for me to tell. Yes, okay. All right, so as I said, um, a little bit of this is going to be repetitive, but I'll try to move quickly through that information. So just to go over the charge of the committee, just um, so we're all super clear. So our mission is to conduct an analysis of the state of public of our education facilities in Amherst. Um, then we will be providing recommendations to the governing bodies, so Hegan and Amherst School Board, regarding the interim and long-term facilities needs of the public school facilities in Amherst, taking into account educational outcomes and how to best level the cost impact to residents in an efficient manner. Encar encompassed in the charge are the following facilities, Clark Wilkins, Amherst, and Sohegan. And here's a list of our committee members. As you can see, we have uh, a really good array of stakeholders. We have board members from Sohegan and Amherst, um, and Pim is the Mont Vernon rep for Sohegan. We have uh, community members, both members who have students in the schools and those who don't. And we have our um, SAU staff, Adam and Michelle. Yes, she is on there. All right, so as you recall, um, with the passing of the Amherst School budget, the um, architectural firm Lavalle Bressinger was hired to complete a comprehensive study of the facilities of the Amherst School District. And just a reminder that this is the same firm that completed the Sauhegan 2.0 project several years ago. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to go over the steps that have been completed to date. Great, thanks Amy. Hi everybody. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, yeah, so I'm also going to talk about um, kind of the timeline of where we are uh, now, but we thought it might be nice to review um, what happened to get us here. So in 2017, capital needs assessments were created um, for the schools in the district, and I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Um, those assessments are really just kind of a nuts and bolts, um, what's needed to maintain um, the, current and the current systems to keep them operating. In March of 2018, the voters funded the Sauhegan 2.0 design phase. In March, um, and actually this isn't on the timeline, but in September 2018, the first Joint Facilities Committee uh, was formed to make some recommendations regarding the buildings within the Amherst School District. In March of 2019, voters rejected the architectural and engineering fee fees for the Amherst design phase. In May of that same year, the South Hegan 2.0 concept design was completed, um, and that involved um, a lot of work with the schools and the community council. In December of 2019, Superintendent Steele held a facility summit to discuss the FAU-wide facility needs. And then also not on the timeline, um, January 2020, the current Joint Facilities Advisory Committee reconvened. In March of 2020, voters approved the architectural and engineering fees for the Amherst design phase for Clark Wilkins and AMS as part of the ASD operating budget. Voters also approved the funding for the capital maintenance reserve funds in Amherst School District and Sauhegan Cooperative School District, um, signaling a growing understanding and uh, support for the needs that we need to address um, in the community. Uh, Amy, I don't know if I can move this slide, so if you could just go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, this slide was shared in December at the Facility Summit by Superintendent Steele, and we just included it here. I think it's a really nice um, kind of at-a-glance slide um, just to kind of help us all remember kind of why we're going through this process and, um, and where we are. 
And that brings us to today and the work that we're doing on the committee. Can you all hear me? Okay. We can, but Shannon, your audio, at least for me, is a little scratchy. I'm not sure if it is for everybody. I apologize. I just got an error on my, um, on my screen. Is it exactly. still? Much, much better now. That's better okay. now. Okay, super. I apologize. Um, so now um, this brings us to where we are today. Um, and you all have probably seen this timeline before, so I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it. Um, there was some language on the timeline that was a little confusing um, after we started socializing it, so we've made some minor tweaks. Um, phase one of the timeline, April and May, we're really excited with the progress that La Valley Brunsinger has been able to make. Um, they have done an existing conditions analysis, so they have our capital needs assessments to work from. They have completed floor plans for all of our um, school buildings in Amherst School District um, that actually show how we're currently using every inch of space, which is a really important place to start. They have surveyed our staff, um, and we'll share some highlights from that here in just a moment. Um, and then under step two, I believe this, the original timeline said something like develop educational vision which was a little confusing because really when we talk with the Valley Brunsinger, we're talking about developing a facilities master plan vision that aligns with our educational practices. So we've tweaked the timeline to better reflect that. Um, and that's really where we are right now. Um, that second phase, engaging the community and um, the Valley's doing their work there with the um, uh, facilities master plan and vision. <clears throat> so that next step of engaging the community, we're spending a lot of time on. Um, a subcommittee work uh, within the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee to develop those questionnaires. Um, then that kind of takes you through August and September, and that last dot um, stops with our recommendations from the committee to the boards. <clears throat> and at that point, um, everything is sort of left uh, depending on where, where the boards land. So the next timeline, if Amy can, if you can, yep. Um, so if the recommendation involves something that would go on a ballot and the board supports that, then this is kind of what the next timeline would look like in the next phase of the process. And I hope you all can hear me. I keep getting a strange error message. Yeah, you are, you are scratchy, but. Yeah, okay, sorry. No, that's better again, that's weird. Okay. All right, and so Amy, if you could go to the next slide. So now I just wanted to share a few of the highlights from the staff survey, just to kind of give everyone a feel of the temperature and kind of where we are um, from a staff point of view. At AMS, the significant issues that were a common theme um, noted by staff included acoustic separation issues, poor HVAC, and the portable walls need replacing. Uh, some of the desires from the staff that, had, that were noted more than once, breakout spaces for student use, student and teacher storage, flexible furnishings, and collaborative areas and conference rooms. And at Clark Wilkins, if you go to the next slide, Amy, the significant issues there, poor electrical, access to power, um, poor HVAC, poor lighting, the CAF Bay gym shared space, um, and the STARS program needing more space for common themes. Um, and then desires were, were for more uh, classroom and supply storage, separate gym, staff workroom, larger classrooms, and uh, moving the fifth grade back to Clark Wilkins. So the next step is um, to conduct a community survey, which we're currently developing now, and I'm really excited about this phase of the process. Uh, it will allow us an opportunity to um, hear from our community, you know, what are they aware of? Um, is happening in our school buildings? Do they know this process is taking place? And what would they like to see and what do they expect? And then Amy, did you want to talk about the future, the next steps, or did you want me to do that? Yeah, that's fine. So um, thank you, Shannon. So yes, as, as Shannon said, we, um, we are excited to get the community survey out there. And we wanted to let you all know that um, we will be including you as board members in that community sur survey. So look for that coming soon. Um, another future item is to make a presentation to the Board of Selectmen. So we thought that it would be a good idea to 
um, present what we have been working on and where we're going um, to the Board of Selectmen since this is an important community-wide initiative. Um, I've exchanged a, a few emails with Selectman Peter Lyon and we'll be developing, um, or rather he'll be uh, letting me know when we can be on the agenda, but I expect that to be soon. Um, in addition, we, uh, we started the work on uh, really a deep dive into Sauhegan 2.0, and that work was done at our last meeting. So really the next steps for that are to develop the priorities and a financial plan, meaning what are the priorities within so Sohegan 2.0 and why, and how would we fund that? Um, how much would it be with what funds and what would the timing of that be? So that's really on the agenda for the uh, next uh, facilities committee meeting to work through that, uh, those particulars and develop a, um, a plan to get that work accomplished. So that's where we are. Um, I will stop talking and we're happy to take questions um, from board members. And also, and I, Amy, can I, I just wanted to add, we have several members from the committee who aren't board members on the call tonight. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the committee. They've been a very um, engaged group. Um, we meet monthly as a full committee and then our subcommittees are meeting every other week. So. There's a lot of effort going into making certain that we're covering all the bases and um, and, and making this a really thoughtful um, uh, effort. Yeah, thank, thank you, Shannon. Yes, thank you to all the members. I saw a number of them joining and appreciate you guys for, for jumping on tonight. Great, thanks, Amy. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, just as a reminder, if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, just go ahead and raise your hand using the um, raise your hand feature. Uh, we're gonna go first to David Chen. Hey, David. Dave, are you on mute? Not now. Here we go. <laughs> Steve. So this, this question is probably for Adam. Adam, um, I'm understanding, and this is before COVID, by the way, I'm understanding the state is still putting money aside for a building fund for cooperative schools. Have you heard that? Um, I might ask Michelle to look into that. What I've... Um, what I've heard is that the state is putting in their biennial budget specific projects that they fund up front as opposed to on the tail end like they used to do in the past. And most of the budget has been going to paying off those old projects, but that some funds, some projects that are shovel ready, meaning they're um, fully designed uh, with full architectural drawings um, and fully bid and ready to go. Some of those projects are being funded in the biennial basis. And as you know, in the old formula cooperative school districts, had a little bit of a priority and I'm just not sure if that's the case right now. So I just don't know the answer to that. Well, well let me ask you a question. In the past, cooperative school districts had priority on, on funds. In fact, I think that was the only way you get funds with cooperative school districts. Um, is there any way we can create a cooperative school district other than Sauhegan with some fashion of the three school districts that are involved here? Is there, I'm, you know what I'm saying? I do, absolutely. Um, so I think those are the several options that we explored over the past four years, looking at reconfiguration or consolidation. Um, and the, the uh, what, short of, you can't consolidate or, or form a cooperative without fully joining the, the, the two parties together, the two towns, school systems together, meaning one board, one budget, one set of board members, et cetera, which uh, we found to be untenable during that process. So the only way you could do it is with the Amherst School District in Mount Vernon. You can't do it with Sauhegan. Is that true? Would that be true? The Sauhegan Cooperative, I'm telling you it's legally possible. So the Sauhegan Cooperative could be expanded to include the Amherst School District or the Mount Vernon School District or both. The Amherst and Mount Vernon School Districts could form a new cooperative between the two of them as a, as a separate entity which would be a little silly, but it's possible because there'd be two cooperatives from the same two towns right next to each other, but you'd have separate boards, separate budgets, separate finances, um, or any of the two towns could form a new cooperative with a different district, whether neighboring or not. So that's also possible. 
So the, really the only, well, there is a feasible way of doing it is what you're saying. It just has to be worked out. And the, the amount of money that's involved is 10% of the, the, the budget, the whatever the building budget is. Is that right? I admit, am I um, right? It used, it used to be 10% in addition to what was given to a non-cooperative school district. So it used to be 30% building aid to a, a, a traditional school district and 40% for a cooperative and even uh, higher for those in high needs. So there used to be a 10% spread. And I've I've stopped, I, I need to admit, I've stopped paying attention to building aid because um, it's it's very clearly being targeted at high needs districts, which we are not. Um, and until that tail of old projects gets lower, I'm not sure that we would be close to the front of that line anytime soon. Uh, but Michelle's more of an expert on, on that than I am. So Michelle, if I'm on the wrong page, please add to what I'm saying. So Adam, it's possibly up to 40%. Of the billing costs. That's what it used to be. I have no idea what it would be. Up to. Sure. I'll say Thank up to. <laughs> Thank you. Great, Laura. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. I wanted to ask about Clark versus Wilkins. There have been some discussions about uh, making Clark like a community center. Uh, has that been on the table and why or why not? You want to take it, Amy, or would you like me to? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say everything is on the table. Um, yeah. And I, I have reached out to the selectmen um, regarding um, possibly looking at, at doing something with Clark for the town. Um, and so we've, we've just really started that conversation. So nothing definitive at this point, but certainly know that it has been a topic of conversation and uh, the committee is, is certainly eager to explore that should we need to uh, not utilize Clark as a school. Did you have anything to add, Shannon? You know, I think, I think you got it right. Um, I think we're still waiting kind of to, to see what comes back from LaValle Brunsinger, um, what they say, um, what their findings are with Clark and Wilkins. Um, but there's definitely enthusiasm, um, you know, just anecdotally, I've heard lots of different ideas for Clark as I've started my work on this committee a couple of years ago. Um, but I think we're waiting, waiting to see what comes back before we can really dig too deeply into that. Great. Any other questions from any other board members? Awesome. Amy, if there is a member of the public that's got a question, how can they reach out to you? By email, show up at your next uh, committee meeting? Um, both, really. I'm, I'm happy to have to take emails. That's not a problem. Um, they can also show up if they don't want to wait. Uh, our next meeting is June 18th. So if they don't want to wait 17 days, then they can just go ahead and email me. That's fine. Um, ACC at spries.com. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. All right, seeing no other questions from board members, we're gonna move on to uh, public comment. Um, any member of the public like to speak? I see Marilyn Gibson's got her hand raised. Marilyn. Hey, thanks all for the facilities, during facilities um, report. Um, I have a question is, are the community members invited to those meetings. So are the community members who are on the committee invited to the meetings? No, ones who are not on the committee. Yeah, our meetings are public. So okay. everyone is invited. Great, yep. thank you. You're welcome. And will that report be on, will that PowerPoint be on our website, SAU? Yeah, we just developed that um, tonight and we're going to um, give it to board members, but we also have a tab on the SAU uh, webpage and we can certainly post it there. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Great, any other public comments about uh, our agenda items for this evening? All right, seeing none, let's uh, move to Superintendent Steele for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, a number of superintendent updates, uh, two major topics are actually agenda items for later in the evening. So uh, I won't go deep into um, 
next year quite yet or our uh, grading software, which is coming later, but updates on several other topics. First, our end of year celebrations have shaped up uh, very well. And um, sorry about that. Uh, let me turn off notifications on my end. Um, and so uh, I'm very pleased to say that each of our schools will be doing something to recognize their students who are matriculating and moving on. Um, and most importantly, our Sohegan graduation will take place in person at Sohegan on June 19th. Uh, there are, are several uh, protocols and procedures that will be put into place for that event. Uh, it will not be a public event. Uh, it's only available to graduates, uh, a limited number of their uh, family members and guests and uh, faculty and staff of each of our schools. Um, and so that uh, we're very pleased that's happening. Um, it will be safe, it'll work well, and uh, we're, we're, uh, we're really happy for our seniors that they get to have that event. Um, all of our other buildings are doing separate unique things uh, for their uh, fourth graders at Clark Wilkins, the sixth graders at Mount Vernon Village School, and the eighth graders at AMS. So very happy about that. Uh, Next, in terms of hiring, uh, we have most of our positions at the administra administrative level either in process or already filled. Both the athletic director and dean of faculty position at Sohegan High School are in uh, the final stages and I'm awaiting to hear um, um, if there's a candidate move forward from the high school for each of those positions. Um, the secondary director of curriculum instruction and assessment position at the SAU is still open. As the board knows, we've had a couple of candidates that we've been close with and none that we're ready to move forward with at this time. So the position is still posted. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the, the, title not, uh, the title not having uh, attracting candidates as well as a salary and might have to either have that position be open for this year or uh, hire someone at a, at a lower level to do part of the job and not the full job, like a grants manager or something like that. But uh, something we'll need to talk about as we go through the budgeting process this fall. Uh, most of our uh, teacher positions are um, in, in the either finished or in the final stages of hiring all of those positions that we know about. Uh, our principals and their, their uh, teams have done a great job hiring quality people. Uh, we continue to attract high quality candidates uh, from all over the state and the country who want to be here and um, who come to us often knowing a lot about us uh, from either conferences or people that they know. And I'm uh, continually impressed uh, with the, uh, the caliber of people that come down the pike for us. So that's my hiring update. Uh, we have um, tomorrow night, the Sohegan board will be um, hopefully adopting a new transcript for the class of 2024. That's the incoming freshman class next year uh, that was developed over the last several months. Uh, in conjunction with uh, parents, administrators, teachers, um, uh, specific outreach to, I believe it was over 50 parents at the middle school that participated in a forum and provided feedback. And uh, we're pleased to have that process at its end phase and I hope to have that approved tomorrow night. Uh, I mention it here because it does affect all of our students that end up at Sohegan High School. Uh, one item of note that the uh, SAU board will need to sort through is our school start times. Uh, as you know, the SAU board has charged me with looking into a plan and developing a plan for how our school start times could be adjusted for not this fall, but the fall after in the fall of 2021. Uh, one challenge we have right now is at Sohegan High School, our schedule needs to be adjusted to accommodate this change for school start times. And uh, that's run into a little bit of a, of a snag. Um, I'm excited to have Mike Berry start July 1 and, and carry the mantle and move forward on that. Um, Bill's done a great job with it, but it's something that we need um, to see to the end and uh, that does affect the other school districts because uh, while school start times are something that affect every school, it's possible for each school and school district um, to prevent the other districts from moving forward in that initiative because of how we share our buses. Um, unless we want to have more buses than we currently do it at a far greater expense. So that's something that this board as well as the other uh, constituent school boards will need to wrestle with over the next several months as we move forward with that. And then my last two items are both for Michelle. Um, I would like to provide a financial update on COVID-19. Uh, did we see an increase in any costs, et cetera, and how the CARES Act might affect us, which I'm gonna say, as far as I know, the CARES Act regulations have still not been published unless they have in the last couple of days. 
Um, so I'm gonna ask Michelle to speak about that and then give also a, a 30 second update on our unassigned fund balances for each of the three districts, even though we're gonna talk about those in more detail with each of the other, of each of the other board meetings this week. So Michelle. Thank you, Adam. Um, I am unmuted, right? Yes. Um, so first to talk about the COVID-19 expenditures, what we did at the very beginning of our uh, facility closure and the COVID-19 issue is to uh, set up a method that we could track expenses that were related to COVID-19 um, expenditures. Items that um, specific to supplies purchased for that purpose or expenditures where we were continuing to support uh, like our bus company, for instance, where they weren't transporting students, but you know, in um, agreement with what was requested by the Department of Ed and the governor for support, continuing to support those organizations, we continued to have some expenditures. Um, we did have modified expenditures, as you recall, because we've negotiated a, a credit with the bus company and are still in the process of um, finalizing that credit with a second bus company that we use. But from that perspective, we have also had reductions in expenditures because we were operating remotely and therefore not purchasing specific products that might have been used in, in the building. So there was a shift. Um, we do have an unreserved fund balance in most districts that um, was in line with or greater than what we had anticipated and we have expenditures that we had not planned on. So to some degree, some of that washes um, in, I don't know if you would like me to go through the dollar amounts in each um, district just to share that, or that if that is uh, sufficient to give you sort of an overview of the COVID expenditures. That's good, okay. Um, regarding the, uh, funding for COVID-19. I know that there's a lot of information in um, the news about resources for private organizations in terms of grants and loans and funding, um, none of which is really a funding that we are eligible for as a school district. We have received um, some grants from IDEA funds. We had some additional funding come in for Amherst, we had $7,000 and Mont Vernon, $3,000 and Sohegan, $5,000. It's, as I said, through IDEA um, earmarked for remote learning. And that is a ESY support that Meg will be, you know, working with to define, you know, how we best utilize those resources. Another area of COVID funding that is, we anticipate coming through is going to be allocated on the basis of Title I funding, and we anticipate that that will be about 85% of our FY20 Title I funding for each district. Uh, nothing has come through on that yet, and we anticipate that that might be for additional summer programming as well, but I don't have specific numbers on that yet, and, and nothing's been um, identified in our grant program around that. Uh, we did have, we did attend a webinar at the very beginning of this process that was hosted by uh, Homeland, Homeland, Homeland Security and FEMA talking about CARES Act and specifically the funding that was available. And again, that sort of emphasized that most of the, the dollars really didn't pertain to our um, type of organization. So that's on the COVID. And then on the unreserved fund balance, we continue to monitor that. The, um, we had identified as through, through May what the unreserved fund balance was by district. Uh, the end of the last month of May was just completed yesterday. So we're continuing, continuing to evaluate those reports. Uh, a first blush didn't see any major shifts from what we had provided in May, uh, but we'll be going through that in much more detail this week as well. Anything more that you would like me to share on that, Adam? Okay. 
That's great. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, that concludes my superintendent's report. Uh, unless there's any questions. Stephanie Grund. Um, so Michelle, I'm going to ask you a question back on the COVID-19 funding. You didn't mention anything about any of the food service funding. Where does that stand? Are we getting money in or what do we anticipate? When do we anticipate seeing it? Um, That's my a understanding is, yeah, I understand we're talking about extending the service through end of June at least. And what's all that mean? That's a good question. Um, so we are continuing to operate a food service program is operated through Sohegan. Um, we are continuing to hold employees harmless, if you will, through uh, their regular contract year. So that means in the districts where we are not serving food, that there is a loss that is already incorporated into the unreserved fund balance projection because um, per RSA and because of the federal folk, federal program, um, the food service program, it cannot have a loss. The um, operating budget must support that. So that's already been factored in to, to that. We do anticipate continuing the food service program through Sohegan through the end of June under our current fiscal year structure. And we are billing for the meals that are served in that program. And then we will continue through the summer months as well to offer um, meals to folks as well. We're serving about uh, 100, 120 meals a day at this point. So we're not gonna see any funding through the CARES Act, which you originally, so then are we no. allocating the expense that Suhegan is absorbing for all the other school districts? Well, so Hegan's also getting the revenue. So we had talked about- Well, that's what I'm trying to say, what, reven what revenue's coming in? That's what I'm confused. So for the meals, because it's a food service program, so we're able to bill per meal as we typically would. Who are we, I guess, so we're billing the state, just like normal? Yeah. Okay. And the criteria is, during this period of time, the criteria has been modified to some degree that families are eligible for uh, support that typically um, might not have been. Okay. Thank you. Uh, David. So Michelle, is um, I remember that the unspended fund balance for the SAU was around $50,000 plus or minus, is that correct? Yeah, it was a, a, a little bit more than that, but it depends on what, how you look at the unreserved fund balance because there are several different pieces to it, if you recall. Well, the, the amount that could be spent on projects uh -huh. before the end of the year. So the SAU operates a little differently in that it does carry from one year to the next and the, okay. the reserve is used to offset the apportionment that goes to the other districts. Okay, is, is that gonna be, is there, um, a plan to spend that money, whatever it is, a little bit more than $50,000? Is there a plan to spend that money now or are you just gonna hold on to it for two No, years? That, that money would carry over and go against the next budget cycle and would reduce the apportionment. But could you spend it this year, this fiscal year? So there's different components to it. There's the revenue side and the expenditure side. Um, I guess the short answer to your question is yes. And then the apportionment will be greater during the next budget cycle. And there is no plan to spend whatever it is. No. Now, although there is an amount that goes, if it's not spent, there's a budget amount for repairs that if that's not spent it um, per prior, um, approval and authorization by the boards, it, it is retained and goes toward sort of a contingency fund for repairs at the, of the building. Just, you know, I know this isn't, uh, this is a public piece of information and everything, but in some way, do we have any sanitizers, spray sanitizers in this, in the SAU at all? We have the, um, so again, the short answer to that question is, no, but we do not have any custodians at the SAU that would be qualified to handle them either. 
We do have custodians that come in that have been certified to use that equipment because they are chemicals that require specific training and the equipment that requires specific training to handle. And they are coming in um, each evening and sanitizing the SAU building. So we do have sprayers in each of our facilities. Uh, that we own in each of our facilities? Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, thanks, David. Tom? Yeah, so I just had a question regarding the school times. Adam, do we know when we could get something to look at with this? I know that we wanted to start, um, you know, really going heavy on this this year and then have something to present, you know, no later than the end of the year next year. But, um, you know, once you get to budget season, a lot of things get set aside at that time. Yeah, until we sort out a Sohegan schedule, we're not going to have the ability to move forward for any of our schools. And so that's going to be something uh, that uh, our new principal, Mike Berry, will have to tackle once he hits the right when he arrives. Thank you. Laura. Uh, I have a couple things. Um, the start times, when do you plan to bring that to the board? I, as you know, the um, feedback we received from students was that 70% of them did not want the large change that you, an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, have you gone back and looked at something in between? Something smaller than that? Uh, right now, the Sohegan schedule change was that uh, middle ground that was finding the the ability to compromise and make sure that we didn't have to move as drastically as we were planning to. So until we get that sorted out, we're stalled out on the school start time proposal. Right, but that would have still been an hour and 45 minute start later. I don't remember there ever being something that was an hour and 45 minutes later, um, but uh, I could be wrong. Okay, but what time did you have for the start time for Sohegan? We were looking at between the latest we ever saw was nine nine o'clock, but we were targeting eight thirty or eight forty five, uh, which is about an hour later. Okay, so nine would have been an hour and forty minutes. But uh, regardless, we are uh, um, we're waiting until that schedule can be modified. Okay. Um, and when do you expect that to happen? That's going to be something that Mike Bear is going to have to work on when he arrives. Okay. Uh, I have questions about the strategic vision, specifically how they affect Sohegan. Um, can we address this tomorrow at the Sohegan meeting? And um, are you planning to? And Yeah, Laura, I, I, I can interject there. So the strategic vision is definitely something that's gonna be on the radar at the SAU level. And uh, at our last uh, four chairs meeting, uh, we came up with the concept of trying to create a year long calendar that uh, Pim had mentioned in his S uh, Sohegan board update, that that uh, calendar be mapped out and allow all board members to come up with ideas uh, and come up with a timeline in which those ideas can actually be discussed. So everyone's prepared to discuss them, talk about them, uh, intently and with purpose, and um, the strategic vision is definitely going to be on that list. So whether it's going to be in September, whether it's going to be in October, November, that's something that we haven't decided yet, but it's definitely going to be on the radar. Okay, uh, I think it's relevant now if you're intending to implement part of the vision for the fall restart. Um, online learning, differentiated diplomas, dual enrollment. I mean, these are all things that need to kind of be, I believe, um, spelled out to the board. Great, thank you for your feedback. Uh, I have another question. I have questions about the 2024 transcript and grading, which is also on your superintendent report. And we can discuss that at the Sohegan School Board. Summer? Yeah, that's a that's an agenda topic for tomorrow night. Correct. Okay, because they were on both. You also had grading. Should we just discuss grading tonight, or should we discuss grading at the Sohegan School Board? Well, uh, the our grading update is an agenda item for later this evening. Okay, terrific. Um, thank you. Great, Josh. 
Yeah, um, on start times, uh, I did want to just suggest, um, while I totally and fully appreciate the autonomy of the community council um, and the role that they play, um, I would suggest that when they are making decisions that are going to affect the broader SAU, um, namely students uh, throughout the system, uh, that they do their best to get um, feedback buy-in uh, from those potentially board members or community members um, so that they can have a clear picture of not just the sentiment of the Sauhegan students, but the sentiment of the rest of the district. Great. Good Thanks, job. Josh. Any other questions for the superintendent or the superintendent's report? Awesome. Seeing none, uh, let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, we are operating a little ahead of schedule, which is awesome. We're going to go to um, consent agenda approval item number uh, one, two, which will be the draft minutes, May 11th, and the April 2020 treasurer's report. I will entertain a motion to accept uh, consent, agendas, uh, consent agenda items number one and two. I'll make the motion. Great, thanks, Beth. Do I ever hear a second? Second. Great, Steve. Let's do a roll call vote, starting off uh, in the town of Amherst. Beth. Kuzma, yes. Tom. Gothier, yes. Terry. Green, yes. Ellen. Green, yes. Josh. Conklin, yes. Pim. Bronster, yes. Thanks, Pim. Uh, Amy. Stacy, yes. David. Ken, yes. Steve Coughlin. Yes. Laura Taylor. Taylor, yes. George Torres. Torres, yes. Stephanie Grund. Grund, yes. Sarah Lawrence. Lawrence, yes. Peter Eckhoff. Eckhoff, yes. Jess Hinckley. Not in attendance. Uh, Scott St. Dennis. St. Dennis, yes. And O'Keefe, yes. So 16, yes. Uh, one uh, absent. Uh, passes. And uh, moving on next to the update regarding school reopening, uh, the superintendent. Thank you. Um, so we are going to reopen our schools in the fall. I just want to say that to parents that have had their kids home um, since March, uh, we will have school in the fall. Um, what it looks like is still to be determined. And we know uh, that there's a lot that goes into this decision about what school has to be um, in the fall. So first, uh, some pieces of data. Uh, we surveyed our parents and our faculty, and we asked them both a similar question, which was, um, if we cannot do full social distancing at school, but we take reasonable precautions, would you be comfortable sending your child to school in the fall, or would you be comfortable coming to work in the fall? And uh, about a thousand parents answer the question, and uh, over 100 faculty answer the question. And in both cases, about two thirds of the respondents, the answer was yes. And one third, the answer was no. Um, and so what that uh, says to, to me at least from, and now this is mid-May, is that there are, are parents, uh, staff members, faculty members, administrators on uh, two very opposite sides of, of this issue um, in terms of their comfort level. Um, the, the further questions uh, indicated as well that people are still uh, polarized on that very topic. And so a lot of time still has to pass, but uh, what we have to do, I believe, as a school system is make sure we're thinking about all of our students and all of our faculty members during this time, because we are not going to find a solution where everybody is comfortable in the fall. Um, I have already received many emails from parents, uh, some of them saying uh, you had better open school in the fall. Um, without a doubt, you'd better find a way um, to open school. And I've had others already reach out to me saying, no matter what you do, my child is not attending school this fall, no matter what. And you'd better have a remote learning option available for me. And, uh, and those are the two extremes and various levels of 
of emotion in between those, those, those two extremes. And so uh, uh, we know that we have to, to, to look at this issue from many facets and, um, and do our best to get this right. And so with that in mind, um, I'm putting together a task force to, uh, to guide me and to provide me with advice um, that I can also use to inform the boards um, about what we need to be thinking about and what we need to be doing in the fall. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, I, I wanna say that all board members will be invited uh, to participate in the meetings and to be a part of the process. Um, but uh, this, this task force is largely to help inform me and my administration on the recommendations we will be making to you as board members about our plans for the fall. Um, and so with that in mind, I've, I've targeted five different groups of people. First is our school nurses and community medical professionals. We have several doctors, nurses, uh, people in the medical field and uh, our school nurses to rely on for the scientific side, the medical side, and the advice relating to our specific actions regarding this, uh, this issue. And so that's one group. The second is our principals and administration within our SAU and outside of our SAU. So including people that live in our community that are um, administrators in other school systems um, or retired uh, school administrators are gonna participate. Um, a third group is our faculty, our staff and our associations, meaning our, our unions or our, our uh, PPC at Sohegan High School. So all of them and their representation will be invited to participate and attend and provide us with feedback from, the, from that perspective. Um, parents and community members is the fourth group, uh, meaning all of the parents that are represented in our schools, plus community members that have vested interest, a vested interest in, our, in our school system. And the last is, of course, our students. Um, and so uh, the, the big group, the main task force is gonna be representatives from each of those five smaller subgroups. Um, and I've asked people uh, to participate in those groups. And then the smaller subgroups will have more people join in either on a volunteer basis or the people that are uh, chairing those smaller groups will have the opportunity to invite, to invite more people. Um, I'm pleased to say that uh, on the, um, that there are, uh, for our school nurses and community medical personnel um, folks, we have uh, J.M. Vore and Jim Manning who are going to participate at the core team level from that group and then several others that will be in the subgroup from the principals and administration and apparel is representing the principals. Um, a retired superintendent, my mentor Henry LaBranch is going to serve on the committee as well as Dan Black, who's the assistant superintendent in the Londonderry school system. Um, from the uh, faculty, staff and associations, um, which will include also some of our school board members, Stephen O'Keefe and Amy Facey I've asked to serve as the current SAU board chair and the uh, past SAU board chair. Um, and then a couple of our teachers will represent uh, um, those groups at the core team level. From the student side, uh, Georgia Craven will be the student rep to the core team. Georgia is going to be a senior and is the community council moderator this coming year and uh, is, um, is pretty eloquent in, in her uh, whenever she speaks and will be, do a great job. From the parent and community members, um, our three moderators of our th three school districts have agreed to serve. So George Bauer, Peter King, and Nate Jensen. Um, I've asked uh, also um, Shannon Gascoigne uh, to be a part of that group since she is um, consistently involved in, in many things, as well as uh, selectmen slash state rep uh, representatives. I've asked uh, Reed Panacetti as a Amherst selectman's rep, who is also a state rep, um, to kind of be our state connection there. So, um, and John D'Angelo, you're certainly welcome to attend as our official selectman's rep, um, as well as Kim Roberge as a, a selectman's rep from Mount Vernon. So that's the, the, that's the team and that's the group. Um, we're going to start meeting next Thursday. I'm gonna call our first meeting after feedback from the SAU board this evening. Um, all of our meetings will be open to the public via Zoom and we'll uh, have the opportunity for the public to see exactly what we're discussing and debating. And we're really going to wrestle with uh, five key questions to start. Um, and I wanted to go over those with, at the SAU board level. Um, there's several, several, many, many things that have to be sorted out, uh, but he, these are the five uh, key questions. First, what is the right overall modality for school? Is it split sessions, alternating attendance? Is it parent choice with reasonable precautions? Is it fully remote until we achieve herd immunity? 
That's the, the key number one question is what's the modality of our school system in the fall? The second is what is the best way to track individual student progress, growth and, growth and achievement? So whatever we're going to do, it's gonna require that we are on our A game when it comes to tracking student achievement and we know that. Third, what competency recover, recovery mechanism should be employed for school startup? Meaning when we come back to school in the fall, what do we do to make up for any gaps that have, that have uh, surfaced during this time in the spring and then over the summer? Fourth question, what safety precautions should be put into practice when people return to the physical school building? And then fifth and last for the key questions to answer, answer how do we engage our constituents to ensure consensus in our community? And so uh, this task force, those are not easy questions to answer or, or for us to wrestle with, but uh, th that's our task between now and August 1st. Um, August 1st is my artificial deadline for when we need to be reporting back and have a plan in place for the fall because our parents are going to need to make um, arrangements for, for their family and for their students. And so that's, that's uh, the school reopening update. Uh, I'd be glad to take questions from the board uh, or the community about uh, this so far. I do wanna say while uh, I've, I've asked some people to participate, um, I want you to know that everybody is welcome. Um, I can't have a core team that has 55 people on it, um, but I could probably find 55 people that would provide excellent input for us. And so we're going to moderate that through the use of these subgroups where there will be plenty of opportunities to provide voice. I also wanna to say to the community that we will be asking you uh, for your input and feedback during this time. So please look out for, even though it's the summertime, please look out for surveys and requests for comment or input because it'll be very helpful in helping us to determine our, our course of action. So that's my update and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Great, as a reminder, just please make sure you use the raise your hand feature. Uh, I'm assuming that there's going to be a lot of uh, questions during this portion uh, and we will open up questions also to the public as well during this uh, because it's a very important um, uh, topic that's uh, front of mind for a lot of folks. We're gonna first go to uh, Beth. So as part of this, um, so I guess I've kind of got um, two thoughts is, is um, I think there's a lot of families that are also on the fence. You know, there's some that answered hard no, some that answered hard yes, but I think there's also a lot that are on the fence. And um, I think something needs to be thought of and very clearly planned out of how we're going to plan for classrooms for kids that are on the fence, that a lot of it will depend on the safety measures that are cut, that, you know, are decided on, um, that allow families to decide whether or not they feel it's safe or not. Um, because it's, it's going to fluctuate the numbers. And at what point do you need to know an answer and what I think families need to know how to give you the answer um, of what plans need to be made for their students um, in the fall. Um, and then my other question is in your meetings, um, the large public ones or the individual ones, will there be options for, will it be for the community to just listen in or will there be the opportunity during those meetings for them to speak up and um, provide public comment like they do in our meetings here? Yeah, uh, there's, we're going to get public comment every opportunity we can. Um, I, I can't say that every single time we meet we'll have that same opportunity because that could uh, take a while. Um, but my uh, my goal is to hear from as much of the public as possible as possible where we can still move forward and, and get our work done. So uh, there will be, uh, I'm committed to that for sure. Nope, Steven, I think you're muted, there you go. Yeah, space bar's not working tonight. Uh, Laura Taylor. Did you um, solicit the parents and students on their experience with online learning so that um, you know, we can learn from this and move forward? And can you make that available, the raw data, so that we can all get a better understanding of how well it worked and what, what didn't work, please? Yeah, one, one thing we're going to have to do is get feedback on what worked and what didn't work this, uh, this past spring. We haven't done that yet, uh, but we, I think that's something the task force will, will be looking at doing, and I have no problem providing that data to the public. Great question, Laura. Um, any other board members with questions before we move to the public?
Okay, here you see none, uh, Marilyn Gibson. I was also looking for the raw data as well. Um, I was interested as a uh, community member and a grandparent to several children in all levels of education in the community. So thank you for asking that question, Laura. Okay. Any other questions? Stephanie. Yeah, so and um, how are the teachers feeling having to wait until August to know? I mean, I know that you cannot provide any information before that because it's just, it realistically is not possible. But for them to teach online versus in a classroom versus a mixed mode, that's tricky <laughs> after what it, my kids experienced this fall, this spring. So how are they feeling after this spring? Because they've got to be exhausted. Our teachers are feeling tired. <laughs> That's how they're feeling right yeah. now. Um, we made it to the finish line and, and they're in recovery mode right now. Um, but uh, I can tell you that the, the teacher response was similar to the parent response and that about two thirds of them are comfortable coming to school in the fall as of right now. And a third aren't, although it was closer to 50-50 at Sohegan High School. That was the kind of the outlier in terms of that survey question of, of faculty. Um, and so uh, I find it interesting that there's roughly similar data between the, the, the two data sets. Um, and it leads me to believe that maybe there's uh, some synergy there that we can work out and use to our advantage. But one thing that's for sure is that uh, remote learning is very hard on families, very hard on teachers. And um, we have to look at how is it possible to do both at the same time? I'm not sure it is, except in maybe some specific uh, cases. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Kelly Schmidt. Hi, um, Kelly Schmidt, I'll do the official um, 11 Patricia Lane Amherst um, thing. Um, I guess my question was pretty close and in, in along the same lines of um, just wondering if, you know, August 1st is kind of enough time on I know you need time to make the decisions on the front end of what to do, but is August 1st going to be enough time to put in place the things that need to be put in place and to um, make decisions? And I'm specifically thinking around, you know, say you were to make a decision that you're going to do part, um, uh, you know, partial allow people to opt in for um, whether they remain home, remain remote learning or are in school. Um, one of the things that's been communicated so far is that um, there's gonna be, at least at the lower grades, um, a strong attempt to keep the cohorts the same. Um, moving with that, and I could see if the choices are different amongst them, that you might wanna split that up um, and change the cohorts so that you would have you know, one class be the full remote learning class and one class be the, um, you know, in-person type class, um, you know, or similarly doing some sort of split where maybe the younger kids all go in, but the older kids that, you know, the Sauhegan um, kids stay with remote learning. I don't, you know, I'm just various different um you know, combinations of the stuff. And is August 1st really going to be enough time for us to implement that sort of thing? I guess that's my concern. Yeah, great question. So I know we could get the job done by January 1, uh, for sure. Uh, we just don't have that much time to work with. So um, uh, I, uh, we need as much time as we can possibly muster balanced with how much notice our parents and teachers need to get their lives in order for August 31st when school is slated to start. And so I would say uh, in regards to what you're thinking about, you're thinking about it the way we are thinking about it in terms of the options and really everything is on the table. I, I can see us as of June 1st, everywhere from we are fully open to we are fully remote uh, as of August 31st and everywhere in between is on the table right now. Um, I personally would like to delay the decision as late as possible so we have the most recent data to make the most informed decision um, but again, balanced with how much notice our parents and faculty need. 
Adam, I've got a question. What type of information we're receiving from the DOE right now in terms of expectations for the fall? Are they really just kind of in a wait and see kind of attitude or are they actually providing direct instructions to you guys? So the Department of Education formed a task force of their own, uh, which is has very wide participation. Um, there is uh, very limited participation from superintendents around the state, which is a concern for a lot of us. But uh, the understanding is that that task force is meant to advise us as superintendents in making these decisions and recommendations to our boards. And so uh, the, that task force has not provided any uh, information yet. I can tell you that we will not be given any edicts from the state, meaning we're not going to have the decision made for us unless the governor decides to extend um, uh, his emergency orders through the fall and, and instruct us that we cannot have school open. But short of that, we're going to be on our own to figure these things out uh, as a community. Stephanie Grunt. Um, actually, Adam, the task force, I noticed the task force is also included a title of redesign. Does that mean that they're trying to address more than just the COVID-19 and they're looking at some sort of redesign of how school instruction is led? Is that, yeah, I'm kind I'm of going, gathering that. I'm going to be uh, crystal clear on this. Stephanie is referring to the state's task force. Yes. Not my task force I spoke <laughs> yes. about earlier. <laughs> yes. Sorry, <laughs> I should have been clearer. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, uh, so that title is in the, uh, in the commissioner's task force. Um, he has described it uh, as he wants to learn lessons from this spring that we can apply to how school might be improved over time um, and how if remote learning needs to be uh, redone, how we can learn from this spring. But there are, there are some who believe uh, he, he might have a broader uh, lens than that. Um, I take him at his word and believe he's looking at just the remote learning piece. Thanks, Stephanie. Pete. Just two quick questions, Adam, about staffing is, do you foresee a need in uh, this, any of the schools to have uh, additional custodial staff and possibly additional nursing staff? One, custodial is preventative in terms of sanitiz sanitization throughout the day um, and, and at other hours, and from a nursing perspective to monitor the health of the students to make sure that we don't have kids there that it shouldn't be. So do we have any idea that maybe we might need more staffing in those two areas for any of the schools? Yeah, I, I think both of those are on the table. And once we get closer to August 1st with our task force, we're going to have to look at all of our resources and what needs to be deployed to make our schools safe again. And we didn't budget for any of those things. And uh, as Michelle shared, we have some CARES Act fund coming our way, but not enough to cover uh, the things that we're going to need to be doing. So that's absolutely part of the equation and great question, Peter. Great, Peter, did you have a second question in there as well, or is that uh, included in the nurses and custodians? No, that was a two-parter. That was, that, that was good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Seeing no other questions, uh, we're gonna move on with your permission. Um, let's go back to the opening items in the superintendent's report because Ms. Grund uh, properly um, pointed out to me that we skipped our school administrators and the principal's <laughs> report. So uh, let's first go close. to- They were so close to- <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill Hagan, you are up first, sir. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick brief update on uh, the activities coming up this week. Um, first, I do want to um, commend, uh, uh, there are a number of people behind the scenes, um, not just staff, but our, but our parent-teacher group um, working behind the scenes to make, to make the end of the school activities, especially for our seniors, um, something special in, in these challenging times. Um, so I just want to a shout out to all those folks, uh, in particular, our senior class advisors who have been working uh, to organize the uh, end of the year uh, planning team. Um, between uh, today and Wednesday, our teachers have been um, um, taking in um, uh, final assignments and doing grading. And by Wednesday, we'll have finalized grading for our students. So that'll be that'll close up on Wednesday. Um, this morning, the scholarship and Honor Society planning team um, uh, finalized their plans for um, uh, an event which is going to happen tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock. 
uh, where we will recognize and honor those students um, uh, who have received scholarships from our community, as well as those students that are on, uh, uh, involved in our Honor Society programs. And so that's going to begin at four o'clock um, it's going to be actually um, quite a technological thing where we're going to be doing some live stuff and we're, we're getting some uh, video feed from, from some of our sponsors of scholarships. So, uh, so we're looking forward to that. Um, on June 3rd, um, we have a big day on June 3rd. We have um, our seniors, uh, it'll be heading into Sauhegan High School um, by time and, and by um, uh, Alpha, uh, last name, to uh, help us manage uh, materials pickup at certain stations as they enter parts of the school and at other stations on their way out, they'll be receiving their caps and gowns um, and yearbooks and uh, their goodie bags. Um, so uh, quite a bit of planning uh, on getting this thing to happen. A lot of people involved in the background. Um, let's just hope uh, that rain that they're talking about uh, holds off and we can, we can get through the day, but um, pretty detailed, so that's gonna happen uh, um, on June 3rd. On June 5th, we've got to go ahead to organize a senior parade. Um, and the, the final details are, are not out yet, but we're looking at a roughly around a 3 p.m. Uh, senior parade where we wanna have all of the seniors involved in in, uh, in their vehicles, um, moving, moving across uh, town for a bit and into Sauhegan High School where our staff and, and, um, and other uh, community members that would like to participate in it will be with some accolades and, and uh, uh, some festivities there for, for them to come through. And that's, that's going to happen on June 5th. Um, and that is uh, about what the activities are for right now for this week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's then go to the Emerson Middle School with uh, Dr. Bersconi. Hi, everyone. Um, so with a great um, time wrapping up our, our end of the school year instruction last week, um, we had an end of the year parade, reverse parade for um, all of our students, I think the official count was something like 287 cars came through. Um, so thank you to South Hegan for letting us plan that route. Um, it was a really great time to, to see so many faces. Um, and I think it was a really important closure piece for both our teachers and for our students. So um, there were many tears and much laughter and it was a really great event. So um, thank you to all that, that helped make that possible. Um, for all of our retirees that were able to come too, since we haven't been able to properly celebrate them, um, community members might have noticed them wearing tiaras and sashes um, to denote their retirement and we thank them for their service to Amherst Middle School um, and really to all of our students and our community of learners. So we have, um, we actually have eight who are, who are retiring this year. So um, if I could just give a quick shout out to Jenny Bryan, Elena Sheldon, Tracy Gagney, Terry Stack, um, Kelly Kalanick, Millie Thibault, Terry Lacoste, and Ginny Day and thank them for their service and support of um, our whole community of learners over the past many, many years. Um, I, won't, I won't venture to guess how many years total um, if, I, if I combine that crew, but um, they're gonna be dearly missed. So thank you for that. Um, we're also working, we have a task force working at eighth grade um, graduation and trying to make that a special event. So that really is a representative of um, different teachers and staff members from across the school that have come together to do that. Um, we've settled on um, Friday, June 12th is going to be our, our event. Um, it will begin at five o'clock. We've involved our student leadership um, and our eighth grade student leadership specifically in helping us to plan this event to make sure that student voice is included. Um, and they have actually changed the, the focus of the event a few times, which was great. Um, so we're going to start with a virtual um, ceremony so that there's a chance for students to give their speeches and things like that. And then um, students felt really strongly about having a chance to wave and say goodbye to all of their teachers. So we're working on plans right now for um, a drive-through loop at the middle school where families will be able to drive through in their cars and we hope that everyone decorates and uh, we can celebrate those students as they come through and hand them their diplomas and send them on their way to the high school. So more information will be coming out for that for families. Um, the task force meets again tomorrow to really outline the rest of those details. Um, this week is really about supporting teachers and wrapping up the school year. Um, 
you know, we never thought we would have, have ended it this way, but um, we're ending strong and really wrapping up. The teachers are working on comments. We have a number of drop-in sessions for them available to help with comments, um, end of the year grading and reporting, um, making sure that everything is really go, good to go so that we can clearly communicate to families um, where their students are at and really um, encourage them for, for the coming summer months. So working on putting together resources too um, that will be being sent out to families to help keep that learning going all summer. Um, we're also running this week just in terms of feedback. So a number of teachers have actually been gathering feedback from students in their own surveys or conversations with kids about what has worked and what has not worked for them with remote learning. So we're offering a number of optional focus groups for teachers this week where um, really asking them some reflective questions on uh, what student engagement has looked like, what kinds of activities that students have um, had the highest participation rate in, what kinds of activities perhaps has really low engagement from students so that we can start to refine our processes and really just gather that feedback so that as we're going through this work over the summer, we're really making sure that we have a, a detailed picture of, of what the experience was from a variety of our different stakeholders. Um, so those focus groups are, are happening over the course of this week and really will continue those over the summer as well. So um, all good things. We, we thank the community for their support in wrapping up our school year and um, looking forward to to really taking a break. That's what we've encouraged all of our teachers to do is that the only thing we know right now is in the fall, we'll be teaching kids. So to take a break, make sure that they take some time to take care of themselves so that um, we can engage in the work again together. Excellent, thank you, doctor. Uh, Anna Peril. Thank you. Um, just thank you to everybody for a great year. The, the parents, the PTA, the students and staff, uh, we finished the year with that. We've got this attitude. Uh, I wanted to also thank our five retirees publicly for their dedication to Clark Wilkins in the district. Uh, I am competitive, Bethany. I've been thinking ours is over a hundred plus years, but to Sherry DeFranco, paraeducator, Louise Gray, kitchen manager, Lorraine Stockwell, reading specialist, Nancy Panacetti, uh, school nurse, and Kathy Johnson, the office manager at Wilkins. Thank you very much for your dedication to the district. Uh, our task force also has met uh, for our fond farewell. We're slated for June 10th and arrange eight for June 11th, uh, feeling that it was really important to have that uh, farewell at Wilkins. Um, we have uh, one to 2.30, the different teams that will be coming through the parking lot. Um, and what we're doing uh, right off is a clap out um, that is important to the students. The, uh, the parents will remain in the cars. They'll come around uh, the school building and they will end with the fourth grade teachers, Hootie and myself for us to be able to give them their certificate, their music t-shirt and uh, fond farewells. There'll be more information going out to the parents as we get closer uh, to the date. Again, placement, I think Kelly had mentioned it earlier. Uh, we have finished all of our meetings with the teachers and special ed teachers. We are still planning on moving students uh, for the most part as a class, K through two. Grade three, we are looking to combine classes moving into fourth grade. Uh, we're still hoping to provide transi uh, transition activities or experiences, whether virtually or in person at the beginning of next year. Uh, but we continue, uh, like everybody else, to plan carefully and remain responsive to the plans that might need to change as a result, as Adam said, to state or district-wide responses. So we have decided not to share te teacher placement until mid-August, and I think that that's uh, consistent with Mont Vernon and AMS. Incoming kindergarten, um, uh, parents will receive a separate communication mid-June regarding inform an information night, and uh, we'll be sending out a survey to provide feedback, um, to, ha to have parents provide feedback for the team uh, to plan for kindergarten classes. Right now, we are at 118 registered kindergartners. Uh, we will also be reaching out to the local preschools to get feedback on the incoming students also. Uh, again, we're excited uh, about the year and the opportunity to provide fourth graders with uh, an opportunity to uh, see us one more time and uh, honor them for a farewell in just a little less than two weeks. Thanks. 
Awesome. Thank you. And for his final and last but not least, Tom Vernon, <laughs> uh, uh, Principal's Report, uh, John Schuttinger. Thank you, Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, just to report out, our um, student days have ended, as you know, by now, uh, and our staff are yet still working, completing those reports for families and for the students to find out how they did for this past year, um, which I have to say has been very transparent along the way. But again, it's great to have that report finalized for them. Uh, that was, all, as you've already heard, going out on Wednesday. Um, enrollment information, yeah, kindergarten is actually, numbers are really good right now in Mont Vernon. We're in the high 20s at the moment, let's say about 26, 27. Most are firm registered, but in our K information site uh, session we had just last month, um, I had about 100% participation of those 27. So I think they're committed pretty well into going forward. Um, that being said, even with having our sixth grade move on, I think our numbers for total enrollment will still teeter or just over 200 students in the building, which is a great achievement as well. Um, and that's not to say anything about the houses currently being built in town. Um, for May events, uh, we had some really great stuff happen. Our sixth grades obviously got to do some fun things as well as they're heading out already. So we started with a panel discussion offered by the um, counselors at the middle school, along with some of our own alum. So a few of our students and a few Amherst students were able to do some Q&A and have that recorded for our students to view. Um, staff at the middle school also recorded videos for our students to see and get to meet already digitally, uh, which was a great experience for them as well. Um, we also had some fun wrap up to our Friday last week. So start off with our student council. Um, we had to organize them to create some news stories. So we almost did our own um, some good news type of uh, transmission. We had that recorded and shown during a talent show piece that we always end our year with. And we also had some recorded videos of students and their talents. Uh, it was well attended by um, students and faculty who zoomed in to watch what was happening. It was a great end of the year. We also had a parade um, two weeks ago and the staff uh, fully enjoyed that as well as the students. And I would say that our participation again was close to about 100%. We had uh, just over 90 families come through and we were at 140 total. So it was a great attendance as well. Um, as you may know already, also device collect recollection starts this week. So our school, along with all in the SAU, will start that recollecting of devices and getting them ready for the fall. Uh, as we all know, we'll need them in some capacity or not, um, but we will be using them. So of course those have to be reclaimed, as well as any school supplies. We're expecting those school books um, when it comes to library materials or classroom library materials to come back as well and any other borrowed products from all of our schools. We hope that the families remember to put those in their cars and bring them back to us along with the devices. Um, and lastly, just wanted to also compliment uh, Christine Lamworld, Assistant Superintendent. I know she's been working on the SAU for um, doing lots of things uh, over this time, but also has been collecting a lot of data and information from all of our staff in the sense of where our students are and uh, where they got to in the curriculum process so we can easily communicate that going forward. And however we start our fall, what that'll look like will be prepared also um, academically as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. O'Keefe. Great, thank you, John. And uh, as a Mont Vernon school board member, I'm pretty sure I can be safe to say on behalf of my other four, thank you very much for your years of service. It's actually meant a lot to our community. Um, the, the way that you integrated yourself and showed up at town events and really became uh, a member of our, our town leadership. It, uh, it really shows. And I think when you take a look at folks uh, seeing and hearing about you leaving and, and their, um, their, their extreme, I'll call it disappointment, but uh, sadness uh, and excitement for your new career and working with Dr. Bernasconi down at the Amherst Middle School. Um, it means that uh, you've made an impact. And the fact that you were selected as our grand marshal of our parade uh, for 2020, unfortunately it was virtual, but uh, that is a huge deal in Mont Vernon. And uh, it, please don't take that uh, lightly that uh, you actually mean a lot to us and, 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 and to our community. So. Thank you very much for your years of service and we wish you nothing but the best. And I want to present to you this official Mon Vernon school board pencil that uh, we like to pass out to all of our people that come to our meetings. I've got uh, three uh, for you. We'll make sure you get that in the mail uh, in the coming days. Um, Sarah Lawrence, did you want to add anything last for that? You did such a good job, Steve. Thank you. and. Um, yeah, John, you know how, how very, very much um, you've meant to the town of Mont Vernon and your impact has certainly made a huge difference. So we definitely thank you. And Steve, thank you very much for so eloquently putting that. We'll miss you, John, but right down the road, we're really happy to have you there to welcome our kids and, 
I think they're all really excited to be able to continue to see you there. So we're looking forward to our new relationship. I am too. I have to say this will be the first time I've ever looped with a student uh, as an administrator. I've done it in classrooms, but I've never done it as an administrator. Um, I also have to say that I feel like I'm the adopted son of Mont Vernon, I'm living only 10 minutes from the school. And uh, yeah, I'm not going away. I'll still be at all the town events. Trust me. Thanks, John. Uh, we did have a question from uh, David Chen. David. This question is, uh, this is for, for uh, Bill Hagen. And uh, I think it's, I was going to ask it privately, but I thought maybe this, since it has to, it does affect everybody in the school, in the SAU, maybe I'd ask it openly. Um, I listened into part of this community council discussion bill that you presented at the, uh, at the community council and basically it wound up being uh, a discussion on switching sixth period with eighth period, which is a sort of an innocuous thing if you think about it, but you know, there was a overwhelming objection to it. But um, what, what I don't get is, is if there was a larger context paid this whole discussion to the whole, oh, I, what I meant to say was there's a, there was a poll done which about five or 600 of the Sahagan students answered the poll and it was about changing sixth or eighth period. But was the context of why we're trying to do this ever brought out? I mean, the context being, you know, improvement to, uh, you know, to the educational process, teenagers have, uh, a learning span that is uh, later in the day than six o'clock, uh, what, what, 7.30 in the morning, uh, a number of things like that. Was, was that context actually created as part of the discussion or was it just changing sixth to eighth period? Um, there, there was, uh, certain, certain students did make um, some, some valid points. So for example, um, I, I do think it was even the, the, uh, the new moderator, uh, Georgia coming in, talked about um, six period um, remaining that short period that she often had a break in and what it what that did for her um, and for other students that she had talked with was it was you know you, I have a couple of classes in the morning you go you go for two long blocks and then you have a bit of a, a break from the academic stress and then you go into your third block I mean so there there were there were um, some conversations, or, you know, um, or points made by students. There were, certainly were valid points about why six period, why they wanted to have six period remain where it was. Um, and so I just think, you know, when I look at it, it's, it's really um, just trying to balance. Uh, the, the committee was looking at moving that block to the end of the day for for the period for the for the reasons we had we had shared. Um, in terms of its academic value there and the kinds of classes we would put there and students that needed to leave early and being able to see teachers every day and get caught up more quickly. Um, but there were some other valid points that were raised um, by some students as well. But, but not, so, you know, not so deeply as thinking about how it impacts the, the, the school districts, uh, you know, potentially start times, that kind of thing, no. Well, my, my thought was that really the, um... The purpose is to benefit the learning process for the students in the high school. That was really where this whole thing started from what I understand. And the right. data that Terry Beam and others presented was just overwhelming about how important it was to, you know, uh, push the start time back for the high school. Were there any other, other alternatives that were offered or did they, was there a response to the, the notion that it would be good, but maybe doesn't fit with the switch of sixth and eighth period? I think, you know, I feel like it was a question of sixth and eighth period when I listened to this. Well, the, the, the conversation actually went, it, it, it went based on the first proposal was exclusively that moving uh, or, or amending the proposal to, to move the, what we were saying, having the shorter block, the eighth period, move it back to sixth. That was discussed uh, on, on a number of occasions and then a vote was taken and the vote was unanimous by community council to to um, approve the amendment. So, um, you know, at that point in time, we what we had on the table was um, removing what we call the white day, which is uh, when kids have all of their classes in a short block. And and um, and so a discussion about that began to emerge, and another amendment um, was proposed from the floor. Um, and and so that amendment. Um, at that point was basically 
um, to put what, uh, the white day back in on Wednesdays. And as th that discussion uh, uh, took place, um, my sense at that point in time was that um, it, it, should that amendment have passed, um, that that would not be good for the, for the school organization. There are a number of issues could emerge from that just in terms of just trying to manage that. Numerous short weeks that we typically have in a, in a calendar year, four day weeks, sometimes three day weeks, emergency days that arise, it would all require management um, to, to try and, to try and uh, handle a schedule like that. So at that point in time, I just felt that we were better off um, pulling the proposal, the, the remaining part of the proposal off of the, off the table. Um, Amy had at, at a board meeting brought forward um, um, something that I was not familiar with, uh, my own fault, but that during that discussion, um, that that second amendment could have taken place and it could have been a vote. And at that point in time, I could have then made a decision if, if it had passed to pull it off. So I did go back to uh, at, at um, Amy's and others' uh, suggestion. I went back to community council to, to put the, uh, the balance of the proposal, which was uh, the removal of the white day on the, on the, um, uh, on the agenda to discuss uh, with community council. And when I met with the executive board, um, I think what they did was evaluate how much time they actually had left in the end of the year uh, and what they would be, would they be able to have any real thoughtful discussion about that? And I think they, they elected not to. So the proposal was not permitted to go back to community council for, for any kind of vote. So basically where we are in the schedule update is that we'll, we'll start um, the school year with the current schedule that we operated under this year. Um, when we do go into the, you know, thinking, thinking positively, when we do, do go into school, um, we'll, be, we'll be running with that, with that schedule that we have this year and then, and then work on some, um, um, uh, Michael work on some new conversations and new, new, uh, new approaches possibly. Great, thank you, Bill. And uh, Terry just wanted to make a quick comment uh, regarding uh, uh, school start times as a community council member as well. Terry, you're on mute. I know, I know. I <laughs> realized as I started speaking. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think that a couple things were against this year, that it took quite a, a while to get through the transcript and for good reasons. And I think that getting that voted on was important, but it definitely stole time away from what it would have gone towards a schedule discussion. Um, I think that having remote learning going on right when students were starting to talk to other students about, okay, here's what the committees come forward with and, and do we like it, do we not? What do we like about it? I think that was unfortunate that they wanted to make sure that since it affected all students, they had a voice. And I do, I was, um, we hadn't really had to make the point too much about start times because the kids were being very good about acknowledging that some of the reasons that this committee had brought forth for why they wanted to do the changes they were asking for were for academics and were for student athletes and we're going to help students whether we change times or not. And they were respectful of that and really the conversation I thought was going in a very positive way and looking at it saying, well, if teachers are the experts and they've said this would help them help us learn better and be better for, you know, they were, and really they had split just the two things because they didn't want discussion of white days if someone felt overwhelmingly about that for that to overtake the other change to that skinny um, sixth and eighth swapping. So I, I feel like it was going in a positive direction. It could be picked up again at the beginning of the year. Unfortunately, it won't be implemented at the beginning of the year. It would be nice to have a year to work out the kinks, um, but it is what it is and they needed to start scheduling. So I understand why it got dropped, but I do think it will get picked back up at the beginning of next academic year. So it's, awesome. not, it's not all lost, it's just not as far as we'd like to have gotten it for a couple of reasons. Great, thank you, Terry. Um, we're gonna move on to the Assistant Superintendent's report regarding uh, grading in the Grading Software Committee. Christine? Yes, thank you, Stephen. Um, just wanted to provide a quick update to the school board about our grading software committee. Um, despite our requirement, we were able to pull a committee together this spring and begin looking at some other grading and reporting software. 
Um, this is our third year in using Empower, um, second year for many teachers, but um, third year for others. And as we um, deepen our use of the software, there have been um, you know, some challenges that teachers have faced. They found that it's not quite as easy as they have hoped. And I think that really emerged um, as we used it to a higher degree and as we added more teachers to using the software, we've got more feedback around Empower. Um, we formed a committee. Um, teachers had volunteered when they created, uh, when they responded to a survey back in January um, around uh, grading and reporting work. So that committee, um, we gave teachers some time to settle into real learning, and then we were able to meet together. I was able to do a pretty deep review first um, of a few different programs, and then um, if those programs met uh, certain criteria, I was able to move those forward to the committee and do some demos with the committee. So we've had a few meeting dates already. Um, our work is going really well. We're down to two different software. Um, one is Power Teacher Pro, which is the grade book that's part of Power School. And another is Teacher Ease, which is um, a grading and reporting software that is more of a still one software, but it can um, integrate Power School pull data from our student purchase system. So we've done that, um, you know, a pretty deep review and are just looking at some of the um, fine green pieces of each of those software and we'll be making a decision um, over the next probably two to three weeks um, as to what software we might pilot for next year. Um, so we continue using Empower. A lot of teachers felt that um, given they were in a remote environment this year and that um, there are some possibilities for um, uh, just some adjustments to our, our school year for next year that teachers wanted to remain with Empower for next year and that um, it would be critical to fully pilot any new software that we looked at to make sure that it, it met our needs. So that's our um, plan for next year. And in the uh, information I shared with the board, there are in the agenda packet, there are links to um, videos to um, really kind of explore some of those software um, that we're looking at too. If, anyone's interested in, in doing that. Great, thanks, Christine. You were going digital there a little bit. I think your Wi-Fi may be just a tad bit slower tonight, uh, uh, but I think I was able to capture 99% of what you said. Thank you. Um, Thank Laura, uh, did you have a question? Uh, I do. First, thank you. Thanks, Christine, for starting the committee and for exploring other options. Um, I had quite a few questions and some of them relate specifically to the high school. Should I ask some of them now and some of them later? How does that work? Yeah, this is a consolidated meeting, so fire away. Okay. Um, when you say that teachers wanted to use Empower, uh, I only have high school students, but uh, when we went to online learning, they, I couldn't find any of their grades on Empower anymore. So uh, I think it was a bit too much for them. Uh, are there going to be other options other than Empower? that they, if they wanted to use a different option next year? So um, the grading software committee is going to be looking at um, de designing that pilot plan. So if we are piloting something next year, um, you know, we want to be careful because we don't want, um, if we're trying out new software, we still also want parents to have access to, um, you know, uh, uh, scores online. So I want to be really careful in not um, disrupting where we have data and important information and making sure that parents have access. But if there's a creative way that we can work, um, you know, a whole role of teachers, um, if they may all be piloting that same software, um, you know, we certainly could look at how students or parents might be able to access that. So that's something that the committee can look at. Okay. Um, have you addressed the maximum available score for and how it's going to be reflected uh, on a transcript? And mm -hmm. right now, the it you know it shows that a four is attainable for. I mean, it appears that a four would be attainable for all classes. But when you have a maximum available score on different assignments, and the student can only earn a two out of two or a three out of three um, on most of your assignments. And then at the end of the year, you don't end up anywhere near a four. You never had the opportunity. Um, I realize that you're still working with teachers. You're still working. This is a new, but these grades are on the grade books for students now. I'm, how can you reflect that? 
Yeah, so there's a few things. First of all, um, we do have summer work planned this summer to um, really look at our assessments across the school year and ensure that all of the assessments provide for challenge and rigor for students. Um, our assessment grading and reporting committee did also share feedback um, that they would like to revisit maximum achievable score and what that looks like in grading software. Um, and as well as the grading software committee um, did also, um, you know, the, the other two systems that we're looking at don't calculate scores exactly the same way that Empower Learning does. So we're looking at what that might mean in that new and different software. Um, does that mean that we have to make certain adjustments um, for maximum achievable score? What does that look like? So um, I, I think I'll be able to provide more information in the fall when we complete some work this summer. Um, but we've been working really hard at the high school level for transcripts to make sure that um, you know there are there's an opportunity for adjustments. If a teacher hasn't given an opportunity for a four, they know that they can make an adjustment moving from Empower into MMS to make sure that um, if for some reason there wasn't an opportunity, we're not harming students. Okay, thank you. Stephanie. So um, I've actually been sitting in on some of the, the uh, presentations for the uh, new grading software pilot. And I have to say the teachers are asking some great questions. Mm -hmm. I think since they have uh, experience with uh, competency-based grading software that they know what they're looking for a bit more now. So it's really good questions. Um, so my question though, Christine, is when the teachers are going to be piloting a new software, is there going to be a chance for parents to also mm -hmm. kind of pilot the same software so you can say, hey, yeah, I can see it better now because I know I saw some mm -hmm. pretty nice views <laughs> on those yeah. as a parent. I was like, yay, um, I, can, I, I understand the scoring and things a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious if you were going to include parents. Um, and then, yeah, my, the maximum achievable score. So the one thing I learned sitting in on these meetings is that the software, some of the software can calculate the core scores by like four or five different ways. Mm -hmm. you know, like there's this medium of recent score, decaying weights, power law, mode of recent scores, highest score achieved, average of recent scores. So then my question is, and I know this isn't something the school board should get into, but <laughs> We, I think as, as families and as students need to understand, how are you calculating a course score? I mean, is it going to be different between every single course? Is it going to be set at a school level? Is it going to be set at an SAU level? But each of those things really makes a difference in how course scores are calculated. And that is a bit concerning when I don't even understand it. Yeah, and it's fairly complex to the implications yeah. for those different types of calculations. Um, so I, I know a lot of times people think like, oh, grading software, just grab something and start using it. Um, but there are critical decision points along the way with whatever software you choose and how your system is designed, how your system will fit with the software, um, and then, you know, making some of those customized decisions. So I feel really strongly that we would need to make an SAU-wide decision as to um, how we calculate um, the, that score, uh, how we use, because it's not just the, the core score that's calculated that way. Every standard score is actually calculated okay. that same way, however you choose. So that committee would need to look really deeply at our different options. Um, now, again, while we're piloting, that might be a really important piece. If we are down to two different options, like power law and decaying average, and we want to try both out, maybe during a pilot, we'd be looking at trying those different calculations and what are the, what's the impact um, of that. But we'd also want to make sure we go back to our research and what does research say about the best way to calculate a competency-based score um, and make that, that decision across the board. Um, related to parents, I think it's really important to involve parents in looking at the software and giving feedback. And what we really want to know is it, is it better? Is it giving you a cleaner, clearer picture? of your, your child as a learner, um, easier to interpret, easier to navigate, those types of things. And um, we would do that in one of two ways. Um, you know, either if we had, for example, as Laura was asking, if there is a full group, like a whole grade level or a whole department or content area that wants to pilot new software, it might make sense for us to have them use that as their primary software and pull parents in. Um, but we wanna make sure that 
teachers are comfortable with using the software before we're opening that up to parents. So that's kind of one of the challenges of piloting. So um, there could be an opportunity or a reason to do that when we design our pilot. So we certainly would consider that. But no matter what, I think that if we got a little farther down the road and we said, well, teachers have been piloting for five or six months, um, allowing parents then at that point when there's more information in the system for them to be able to access and to provide feedback. Um, and we would probably design it similarly to how we had reached out to families around Empower and gotten, um, you know, kind of a, a pilot group together for our Empower access. We would probably do something similar for any new grading software. But I think the teachers, you know, certainly are critical users, but so are the, the students and the parents. And if the software isn't user friendly or giving parents or students the information they need, um, that's critical for us to know before we make a decision moving forward. Yeah, because when I, when I look at those, when I think about how the calculation of course scores happen, and currently when you look at um, some of the things in power, I know my kids have had like a three out of three is the maximum they could do. When, when then you're talking about decaying average, power law, all those things, you can no longer even get to a four ever. Mm -hmm. And those are my big concerns, and we need to make sure that we're addressing those. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, um, our assessment and curriculum work this summer. Um, we're looking at doing fifth through 12th grade. That's going to be a really critical piece for us in making sure that we have those opportunities for students, but I think also transitioning to software that calculates scores differently, um, kind of doing those, those two things together will be uh, really helpful in making sure that it's clear. I, I think the challenge around MAS is that it can be confusing, uh, both to teachers as well as to families. So I think new software um, might show information in a different way to make that clearer. Okay, thank Great. you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Christine, just one quick question for me. In terms of cost, what are the cost uh, parameters of the new pieces of software you're looking at as they yeah. compare to Empower? Yeah, so we're still working um, with the companies and, and sometimes that, um, uh, you know, depending on how we're implementing or, or what that looks like, certainly for a pilot, pilots are usually um, low or no cost. So I'm not too concerned about next year for us to be able to pilot. Um, but the following year, that's definitely something we need to look at. So I'm pulling pricing now. It's probably going to be more expensive than Empower. Um, I already spoke with, but it depends to which way we go. Um, Power Teacher Pro would be an add-on to PowerSchool. And since we've already purchased PowerSchool, um, I'm still pulling pricing information uh, for that company. Uh, that might not be as big of a jump, but if we go with a, a standalone system that is more expensive than what we've been paying for Empower, we've also reduced pricing with Empower because we've been slowly rolling this out um, and really working closely with the company on that, um, uh, uh, really fully developing their product to help better meet our teacher needs. They've been um, you know, really good with uh, extending pricing. So most likely if we move to software, it, um, you know, it, it looks like that would have a larger sense of bringing that information up to that your individual or something else. We've made a decision of which one we're going with that need to be budgeted for for that following school year. Oh, and you're still on mute, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, one last question from Laura. Oh, thank you. Um, Christine, I was trying to understand, um, back to my previous question with the Empower spits out a grade and then it goes into another system mm -hmm. or whatever they're using uh, at this point, you goes into another system. Will that be consistent going forward or at some point are we going to use the Power School or will that be the last yeah, good question. So um, right now we've actually been at the high school, we've had actually our teachers putting final grades into MMS, which is our student information system. Um, so that's allowed us to be able to look at that remote learning time um, and really making sure that if students um, were, you know, doing well before remote learning and were struggling at remote learning, we're able to kind of compare those two and work with students and, and look carefully at, at scores and be able to put final scores in MMS. Now we are transitioning from MMS to PowerSchool. So um, as we move forward, we're able to do an export from Empower and 
automatically import into um, PowerSchool or with, um, you know, if we go with something like TeacherEase, the other program that we're looking at, that also allows you to export and then import. Um, they talk to each other, but one way. So PowerSchool would give information to TeacherEase, but TeacherEase can't put information back into PowerSchool. It is a data pull, uh, but we would rely on that data pull for information. And as we moved forward, once we had confidence in our course scores and felt comfortable after our pilot. So next year um, would be that pilot. Um, so we, we, um, you know, we would be pulling information from PowerSchool to make sure that our classes and our students were in that pilot software. Um, but as far as putting information back into PowerSchool, you know, depending on what that pilot looks like, we would make sure that that information was all, the, all, all, all of it gets back into PowerSchool because that's our, our um, really where all of our data needs to be. That's where we print transcripts from. So that's a critical piece that it's archived in PowerSchool. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Okay. Um, when can parents have access and how would they access their final grades? And have you done any kind of assessment on what do the grade distributions look like? So um, I'm assuming you're asking for the high school. It's a little different in each of our schools. Um, but at the high school, teachers are working on grades um, over the next few days and information will send to them how they pass their grade um, in the vision portal. Um, can't remember again. Sorry. Christine, Dave had given me the suggestion, just have you just take a, a step back from your, uh, your speaker and your microphone that may be uh, able to fix it. Am I, are you saying I'm too loud? <laughs> no, too close. <laughs> too close. Um, I'll try. I also turned my video off, so hopefully um, that will help. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, so for Sauhegan, um, teachers are working on grades uh, over the next few days, and parents will be able to access grades through the vision, which is part of that. Um, so information will be sent out to parents over the next few days for how they can access those grades. Did I answer all of your questions? I feel like there was one I missed. Yeah, so Christine, maybe you can respond back in writing on that one. That that one didn't even come across at all. Um, <laughs> I, if you can, can just quickly forward an email to Adam and then Adam can forward it off to, uh, to Laura. That'd be great just to make sure the communication policy is followed. That'd be sweet. Um, thanks, Christine. Um, public comment number two. Uh, We'll entertain any uh, questions or comments from uh, from the public. John D'Angelo, Mr. Slackman, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. I think this is probably for Bill Hagen or Adam or both. It probably actually applies to all the schools, but my examples come from the high school. So <clears throat> I understand that I'm very impressed that you figured out a way to get an in-person graduation, even if it is socially distanced. Uh, what about the, uh, the individual teams and uh, club events? Typically, some of them have a uh, end of the year award ceremony, dinner, whatever, and uh, they've been told basically don't do that this year. So I mean, if you can get a live graduation, surely it should be possible to allow for at least a smaller team to get together in some appropriately socially distanced way to have an end of the year thing. Bill, do you want to take that or would you like me to? Um, well, if you want to start, I'll certainly um, chip in. I well, I, I can speak to, um, John, I can speak to the prom, for example. We've already made a decision that the prom, uh, as much as we would love to have uh, a prom this year, is not one of those things that we'd be able to pull off. Um, you know, so there are, unfortunately, there are going to be some of these events that we're just not, that, that it's just not necessarily prudent to, to pull off. Adam has done, uh, along with a bunch of other folks, uh, some tremendous work on the organization of this graduation to be, um, uh, you know, organized by protocol, very safe, lots of support, lots of volunteers talking to the towns, uh, the towns leaders about how we would have to do this to, to make this a safe and, and meaningful, uh, as close to graduation as possible. And and so, um, it, it is going to be quite an effort to to make that all come together. Some of the smaller um, some of the smaller things that are, are things that we may not have those kind of controls over. Um, and we do have an obligation. I believe we have an obligation to, to uh, create um, at all times safe spaces and safe events if they're going to be labeled school events. 
Right. No, I understand that, and that's fine. I think the football team might have a tough time having such a dinner because there's a lot of them. Uh, it's really hard to imagine a socially distant prom, but you know some of the smaller clubs and activities uh, should be able to figure it out. Um, I know one of the coaches asked the AD, and the AD, instead of saying, come up with a plan that makes sense and we'll see, said no, just no. So, I mean, I don't know about any of you. I was in high school so long ago. It wasn't just the last century. It was a millennia ago. And what I remember is not so much everybody in my graduating class. I was acquainted with them, but I remember the people that I was in clubs and sport events with. I still remember those people today, even though they're long since forgotten all the other people I graduated with. So, I mean, in terms of a marker for the event, uh, you know, some of these people have been on these teams or in these clubs for four years straight. And, you know, they're going to miss these people when they leave. And not having some way to say goodbye at the end is painful. Now, again, I don't want to suggest anything unsafe, but I think a blanket policy of no, don't even ask the question is probably not the best answer. Thank you, John, for that feedback. Uh, anybody else? Comments from the public? Uh, seeing none, Mr. Superintendent, do we have a non-public session this evening? I see another hand raised, Stephen. Uh, Sorry. That's okay. I apologize. Uh, Courtney Vore. Courtney, did you have a public comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I thought I was unmuted. Um, so the, the teachers have been doing an amazing job with um, remote learning, um, but I have four kids in the school district. So I've seen vast differences between the teachers and you know how they're teaching. And I was just curious if we do end up doing remote learning on the, in the fall, is there gonna be any teacher training going on over the summer or are there gonna be any guidelines for teaching um, or student learning, student participation in the fall? Yeah, thank you, uh, Courtney. There, uh, part of our job this summer is to evaluate what happened this past spring, what went well and what didn't. And then we know we're, we're gonna have to provide additional training for our teachers uh, this fall. Um, there's no playbook for this. So it's, it's, there's no textbooks about remote learning and how to best do. Uh, no, <laughs> right. and everyone's done a great job, but. You yeah, know. Uh, so we will, uh, but we will be doing what we can to prepare our students for, uh, or prepare our teachers for what they will need to do in the fall for sure. Okay, is there a plan over the summer or is that sort of to be determined if necessary? Yeah, it's really to be determined for the late fall before we start after we know what in the world we're doing. So um, first we have to pick our target before we can start aiming at it. Okay, so for late fall, if, if, if we need to do remote sort of in the winter time, I guess. Yep. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Great, Laura, did you have a comment about public comment? I, I was just wondering how many students are taking advantage of the summer school? Um, I don't know that offhand. We have both extended school year for students that have special needs and we also have competency recovery opportunities for students that um, didn't pass all of their classes, and I don't have that data yet uh, with me. We're collecting that at the high school um, over these, uh, obviously, these next couple of days. Parents, some parents have already been communicated to. So we're gathering that data. Should be complete soon. Great. Thanks, Bill. Marilyn Gibson. As far as ESY is concerned, I know that um, I have one granddaughter who has an IEP and um, she is just so zoomed out with the remote learning that she didn't even wanna go, go near an ESY program and her mother was very supportive of that. But I must comment that Terry Lacasse was fantastic with her uh, summative assessment, let's say, of our granddaughter's progress during the school year. So I'd like to uh, send out a thank you note to Terry, even though she 
has retired for the year, it'll be a loss to the AMS. Great, thank you, Marilyn. I'm sure you're not alone in that sentiment. And uh, you know, when folks retire, they they leave a legacy, and that legacy is in our children. So, um, thank you to uh, to her for clearly doing that. Um, seeing no other comments from the public, uh, Adam, was there a non-public session? No, Mr. Chairman, there's not. Great. So uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Great. Thank you, Ms. Facey. And uh, I believe we don't have to even take a roll call vote for that, correct, Adam? Uh, as chairperson, you can declare us adjourned or you can take yeah, a roll Yeah, I vote. declare us adjourned. And for those who would like to uh, attend the Mauvern and School Board meeting, you're all welcome to do so. It's going to be action packed tonight. Uh, Ms. Lawrence is going to give us a uh, quite a quite a quite a presentation. Have a great night, guys. Have a great summer too. <laughs>